Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Straight Talk, the final session of the day. Woohoo! So there's only uh, me, Peter, Julian, uh, between you now and a couple of drinks in bar 37. So we know the pressure is on. So look, as was said, my name is Sarah Ward um, and I'm going to guide you through the next 45 minutes. And we know it's tricky because of the last lot of the day, but Peter and I are up for it. Except he insisted on getting the Swedish flag up here in the yeah, two seats in case any of you actually that. noticed that. Thanks he tricked me into that earlier. <laughs> so look, I'm joined by our esteemed guest, Peter Bonier. Peter is the CEO and co-founder of a company called Kit, which is a Stockholm-based digital media startup in the publishing space. He previously run the digital, vision, digital business division at Bonier Tiedid Shafter, <laughs> my Swedish yeah. isn't very good, and held marketing and digital roles at Unilever, at NBC Universal, and at various smaller enterprises. Peter holds a number of board positions, nearly too long to list, you can see them in your bio, including with IAB Sweden. Uh, he studied at the London School of Economics, and he has an MBA from Stanford, no less, uh, Graduate School of Business. But when I was chatting to Peter yesterday, we had uh, lots of chats before this. One of the things that stood out to me most was he said he's actually an aspiring baker. And he'd like nothing more than to be a pastry chef. So I've told him if he plays his cards right, I'll introduce him to the chefs here and he could be making the cookies and the shortbread for you this time next year. And that could be your next That'd be startup. an amazing customer. Yeah, it'd be all good. Uh, so look, we know it's been a long day. We know some of you have been up early and there's a lot of content, but we're going to try and make this as interesting as possible. And it will be because... Uh, we, we've put a lot of effort into it. We know the poor Belgians didn't even make it here, uh, even though they did get up early. But Peter has a lot of experience. So, you know, he's worked in CPG. He's obviously worked in ENTS with Universal, digital publishing and content. So we're trying to get the most out of that in a very fast pace. So Anita said, I'm kind of straight talking. I'm known to sort of shoot from the hip. Can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. Uh, so we came up with a concept called straight talk. And what it is, is we're just going to basically give you the answer straight in as short a time as possible. OK, so straight talk consists of three parts, one of which is going to be called uh, one of which is going to be called the rundown. The next one is going to be called insert the word and the last one's going to be called uh, odds maker. I'm not going to give Peter too much time to elaborate on the answers. So I'm going to be moving quite quickly and asking him to move quite quickly. So if you'd like him to go to a little bit more depth and elaborate, we will have time for questions at the end. So hold that thought. If you disagree with anything that Peter said as well, we're open to a challenge. It's the end of the day. We want a bit of a challenge. So if you disagree with anything, also write it down and we'll have a little bit of a debate at the end. So Julian's going to be my time, Peter. He's also going to be interrupting. But first and foremost, we're going to start with something called the rundown. So here, I'm going to introduce the topic. I'm going to ask Peter a question, and he has one minute and a half, one and a half minutes to answer that question. He has to give us a very straight answer, and if he doesn't, he's going to be rudely interrupted by this sound, which signals to us, speed up and move on, OK? So, and we'll judge by audio participation whether or not you'd like us to kind of elaborate. But we don't want it to be too one-sided. So I did say whole questions to the end, but we're open to heckles. We're open to cheers and boos if you feel something that you're very passionate about. Okay. So, Peter, are you ready? I am ready, I hope. Okay. So our first topic is innovation. Okay. okay. Some companies are really pushing the boundaries in their industry, and they're, they're innovating through digital technologies, things like crowdsourcing, we see a lot of this. Is there a lot of hype in this, or are there recent brand in innovations that have been driven by technology that you've been particularly surprised at and thought, that's good? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think any industry or brand would really be kind of unaffected by digitization, even if it doesn't... I don't know, affect your core sort of value proposition. Um, I think, you know, just out of many examples, I think last week Spotify and Starbucks announced this collaboration where I think coffee consumers and baristas are going to be able to choose music in, in, in sort of each of the retail outlets. Obviously, it doesn't change Starbucks's core proposition, right? It's still sending coffee in a brick and mortar store setting. But, you know, just using technology to strengthen. You know, what's, what's their core, I don't know, customer intimacy proposition, this idea of being the third place and kind of strengthening that brand message. I think a lot of 
interesting innovation is happening around that sort of space. Obviously, in you know industries like mine, where the core product, the actual product, is being digitized, everything changes. So, but but yeah, I, I don't think there's any industry or brand that's going to get around it. But like, is there, is there a case in instances like this where you've put in loads of effort just to get you know interweave the technology piece, but cost versus return when you get down to hard commercials that it the, you know it isn't worth the effort in the long run? I mean, everyone I think that does projects that work and, and doesn't work. I, we obviously haven't seen how the Starbucks Spotify thing plays out. But it does, I think, go to strengthen really what their core brand proposition is. OK. Just in the nick of time. Yeah. Ooh, well timed. <laughs> Next up, digital disruption. So Netflix, Airbnb, Uber, well documented. All of these have uh, seriously disrupted a traditional business model. What do you see as the next, next industry to be disrupted by digital? And I mean, why? I, I, re I really think we're kind of in the um, I would call it kind of the application phase of the internet, where previously um, a lot of innovation happened in, in sort of siloed parts of a value chain. But now all the companies you mentioned, you Uber, uh, Airbnb, Netflix, all of these businesses kind of disrupt a full value chain, a kind of okay. a full stack value chain or whatever. Um, I mean, I think now disruption is like the full stack approach is, can, can disrupt industries that previously were hard to disrupt. Like, um, for policy or regulatory issues like healthcare and education. I think education is a really interesting one. You see people like Khan Academy sort of disrupting um, homeschooling and uh, teacher assistance. You have artificial intelligence sort of disrupting the whole test prep space. Um, Coursera offering sort of higher university, world class university education to a uh, broad base of people. I think, you know, the educational space will see a lot of disruption and um, disruption that will also have. Um, has the potential of having huge societal sort of effect, releasing real societal potential. Okay, so it'll, it'll, be, it'll do good as well yeah. as everything else. Yeah. Okay, next topic. We have content marketing. So, as many people might know in the room, there is many variables that means a content strategy might just fall flat on its face. Um, the sheer quantity of stuff on the internet might mean that you have like the most beautifully written pose or you might have the funniest viral video in the world, but it can get lost in the digital deluge. Um, leaving sort of marketing teams and digital teams scratching their head as to what went wrong and probably being very answerable to senior management. As someone who's in the content business, yeah. what advice would you give to people in the room who are trying to craft a content strategy and want sort of tips and tricks? What would yeah, you say? I mean, there are many things to think about. I, I think I'd, I'd point to three things. Um, the first thing I think really hard about is choosing the right metric or the right success metric or signal. Um, I think the, the, the publishing industry and I think a lot of the brands have been way too focused digitally on volume and not enough focused on, on kind of engagement and, and true engagement metrics. Um, I think the second thing I'd, 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 I'd put a lot of thought into is kind of um, executing specifically for each platform. There's been this idea in content that you know you can you can sort of create content once and it transfers over platforms, but we're seeing with you know even in video with the differences between using YouTube and Facebook video are enormous. We can't really use any of the same material. So executing specifically for the platform I think would be the second one. Um, and the third one is just really using sheer volume or iteration. I mean we publish hundreds of stories every week and still I can't predict with certainty what will work and what won't work but certainly the data we get back from each of those sort of stories help us inform our next decision so just like So metrics for built for the platform and volume yeah on the metrics one I'm a little bit interested we have 14 yeah. seconds left um, how it's very hard not to go to the public metrics your view count your subscriber base because your competitors can see it your yeah. boss can see it yeah. so it's hard not to sweat those metrics yeah. what do you do in instances like I that? think with the boss you just have to agree with the sort of ex-ante right this is something that <laughs> happens before your campaign and not after yeah. um, I think with the competition we for me really I we see it as a I see it as a competitive advantage like everyone's focused on volume so let's go for something real yeah. or something that matters. So ignore view counts and things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, like started video views, uh, page views, like those kind of metrics. I, I started video views, who would worth, do, what platform yeah. would do that? That's pre-roll type <laughs> stuff. Yeah, huh? exactly. Next up is shareability. Pardon? 
please continue. We're going to have to hold a question to the end, OK? But you're going to be first up in the questions, OK? But good point. He is an expert in this field, so it is a good one. Our next topic is shareability. OK, so in order for brands to succeed in social media, we know that they need to have a strong brand identity and then sort of produce content in line with that identity. But we've all seen instances where brands do not get it right and actually they've made some serious mistakes. So where have you seen it go wrong recently and why did it go wrong? Yeah, no, I think there are really two reasons why it goes wrong. I think the first one is to your point, you really need to be authentic, right? To And sort of to your original brand messaging. Um, the second, and you know, we see that go wrong sometimes. I, I give you examples, but I'm really, yeah, well, Two. There are a lot of okay. There are a lot of people now. I think that are trying to sort of adopt the language of the internet using kind of memes and cats and things in their commercials. A certain car brand. Yeah. So Fiat did this last year. I think they. I hope no one's from Fiat here. I, I think they didn't really execute on that one very well. Um, I mean, the, the second part when it goes wrong. So authenticity is definitely one. I think the second part is really where, you know, it's just bad judgment really. Uh, any examples of that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think obviously provocation works fairly well for virality, but I think a lot of brands just take that too far. Um, there are certain uh, liquor brands, I think, that sort of uh, try to be funny but are just sexist, and like this, this tends he's to been happen. He's a bit polite. A lot. You might have to pin him in the bar to see even see what liquor brands he thinks got it wrong. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I'd point to authenticity, and this just, it's just a question of taste or judgment. Really. And how do you do that if you're like in a B2B space and have quite a sort of run-of-the-mill brand, shall we say? Well, you know, you'll have to figure out if you can do it authentically. I think trying to force virality into a message that isn't there is just not going to work. OK, next topic. We have regulation, a hot topic at the moment. So if you look at the offline world, you know, if you look at TV ads and particularly product placements and stuff, it's heavily regulated, yeah. and so it should be. Um, but when you move to kind of the borderless internet and the nature of the internet, regulation is very often down to suppliers, yeah. publishers, yeah. and sometimes brands to self-regulate. This can create a number of headaches. Um, and like headaches from a brand's perspective insofar as they're getting a piece of content away on one platform yeah. and then they go and try to put that content on the next and it's rejected for regulation. Yeah. So like my question to you is whose responsibility is it to regulate? And where do you see this going if we don't address it now? I think the optimal scenario is, if, is always self-regulation, right? I, I think that, that usually works best. And the reason it's emerged slower for digital, I think, is that the pace of change is higher, so new platforms keeps on being introduced, uh, which really makes this more difficult. Uh, industry groups traditionally in most markets, at least in Europe, have been weaker in digital than in print or TV, where they've existed for you know, 30 or 40 years. Um, and you know, to you guys, there are a lot of global platforms now that sort of set their own rules, and the rules often come from Mountain View and, or Cupertino, and they're not always adapted to a local market context. So I think for a publisher, for a local publisher, or even for a, for a local brand, um, I, I'd say the solution is to get involved with an industry group if there's one there. IAB is fairly strong in, in the European markets, but there are certainly other ones. Um, the important thing is to involve you know, local advertisers, local publishers, and global platforms alike, which is not always easy, but, but you need to bring in the global platforms into the sort of discussion, otherwise so it just doesn't tip work. to the audience is get involved, get yeah. involved in the industry yeah. body, set up one within your own industry, yeah. and get the suppliers around the table. Yeah. OK. Next topic, launch. OK, so dream scenario here. You're yeah. launching a new brand. Yeah. You have a million dollars to spend on the digital platforms. You're targeting sort of 35 to 44 year old, like primary shopper, so primary food shopper in the, in the household. I won't say week or won't say uh, gender because that's all changed now in the UK and Germany. Okay. So you've a hundred, uh, sorry, you've a million quid on where would you spend? Facebook, Twitter, or Google platforms and why? <laughs> So I, 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 feel, I feel kind of ambivalent to talking about marketing yeah, in front of this esteemed so crown here. But, um, but yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot I could do. There's yet. a lot I could do with a million dollars. Um, <laughs> I think if I had less than that, I'd, I'd, I'd choose one of the three and preferably where my audience is. Um, because it really depends on how 
big of a production budget you have, right? To my earlier point, you have to execute for these platforms very specifically for each platform. Yeah. So, you know, it depends. If I have all, you know, if I can do great execution on all the platforms, I do them all, um, but just for separate reasons, right? So I do Google for the, for the pool, for the search. I do YouTube and, and Facebook for video, but differently. Uh, and I do Twitter to kind of amplify PR and, um, and influence the influencers. But you would be making bespoke creative or content. Yeah, creative. yeah, I, I think that's the main point here. You need to do bespoke creative for each of them. So if you don't have the resources to do that, I think it's much better to do one well than like all four. That one definitely being Google. <laughs> Sorry, that one, one, that one. Definitely Google. Yeah. <laughs> okay, le next topic, mobile. We're doing very well on time. Okay, You're good. good. Okay, I haven't so, heard that gong. So, no, so I, hasn't I, yet. Apparently, I'm too brief. I need to. <laughs> so, the next one is to QR code or not QR code. And I know we have a QR code on our badges today. Uh, so, you know, QR codes have been were touted for years as the next big thing in mobile. And, you know, I see some people laughing and smiling, but it was largely because it showed a glimmer of hope into the future, whereby we were taking something from the physical world and being able to make it into tangible and malleable data yeah. on the online world. So it did merge those two worlds. Despite the overwhelming push and big adoption by some marketers and brands to put a QR code in everything that moved, even food products, I see, um, there's a lot of skepticism as to adoption and whether it works. And the US recently put out studies to say that 50% of smartphone owners have ever scanned a QR phone code and 18% have used to purchase or something like that. So small usage. What's your opinion on them? Are they the holy grail of mobile marketing? We just don't know it yet. And if not, what is? No, so look, I, I think your quotes are the perfect example of, of sort of using technology because the technology exists and not because it makes any sense to do so. I mean, in a sort of print publishing world, we used to try to put QR codes everywhere to add value to the mobile products and never worked. I mean, I, I actually think the key card that you guys used for me to get in today is, I mean, the best application of a QR code I've ever seen. Um, so that said, uh, I do think there's a lot of, like, I do think the, this whole digital physical feedback loop is really interesting. And I don't, I still think it's a, it's a vastly, like, unsolved problem, right? We haven't seen anyone really do digital coupon, couponing very well. And there's a lot of sort of promise in solving that issue. I think we see some promise in iBeacons. There's, there's a few examples of NFC, like near field communications technology that works well. So merging like online surfing behavior with um, micro local kind of push notifications and stuff like that. But, but yeah, it is an emerging space. And, um, and I don't think, I, we have yet to see, I think, the, the, the real great applications of it. So what you're saying is that the link between physical and online, there's something there that yeah. QR codes have sort of been the earlier early leader in. Yeah, I think that was the that was the promise with QR codes. It's just yeah. that it, it was just way too complicated to use, and no one really understood why they okay. were there. Just in time. Okay, our last one. Mad Men. Uh, this was only an excuse. Nita wanted a picture of Don Draper on on screen, so we had to do this one. She insisted. <laughs> okay, so. Art and science yeah. are very different ends of the creative skill. Yeah. And today's marketer has to balance between artistry and science. Um, so with that in mind, to what extent does the big Don Draper-esque idea still hold its weight? Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm not an advertising professional, but I, I, like my view is completely that the idea is still crucial. Um, and uh, if not more important today, at least equally as important. I think what's changed since kind of the 60s is execution, right? And I've touched on this several times now, but it's just a much, much bigger challenge to execute over you know, 30 platforms than executing an idea in one 30 second spot and you know, potentially a page of print or something. Um, and so I do, do think that execution is really what's changed. Uh, the data sort of feedback loop um, that we get digitally is really, really important and really interesting for all kinds of incremental change. You know, mm -hmm. What color should the buy button be? Or when do people lose interest in my YouTube video? Or you know, you, we get all these signals back that are really informative and interesting. Um, but none of them really inform us towards that great idea. And that great idea still has uh, enormous potential. I mean, look at... 
look at the Red Bulls or, you know, I'm biased because I used to be at Unilever, but the Dove Real Beauty sort of mm -hmm. concept that someone mentioned earlier today with sketches, yeah. like how a concept like that can scale over, you know, 10 to 15 years over a vast amount of platforms and executions. I think that's really powerful. And is it an issue, you know, that where primary creatives in most markets still want to build for TV? You know. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge issue. I, 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 we, we've been talking for the last 15 years about when will, you know, when will the coolest advertising agency job be doing yep. digital? We're out of time. Right? Okay, I think we're going to speed this up. We're going to shorten yeah. your time, right? Yeah. So this time, second section, it's called What's the Word? So again, I'm going to introduce a topic. There's only six of them. And Peter has to, I'm going to introduce a topic, then read a sentence with a blank. And Peter has to insert a word in the blank and give me some context within 60 seconds. So we're going to pick up the face and the gonger is going to get very strict, I think. Right? Okay. And the timer starts. Print versus digital. We're becoming more and more online and it seems like we don't have time for tangible media. So Peter, printed newspapers and magazines will be what in five years now? Well, I think they'll still be dying. Still be dying. They will still be dying. Death. I think it's a slow death. And I mean, it, it kind of, I think with print, it's like there are two myths. The one is that it'll, it'll live forever. The other one is it'll die tomorrow. I think none of those are really true. So the problem for print is that, you know, you have a large, if you're a national newspaper, you have a, you have a large <laughs> okay, you're okay. subscriber base. And like that subscriber base is not going away. Like it's staying, you're just not adding any new readers. Uh, and so uh, we're uh, paying subscribers. You but can't survive with an ad finance model in print. And so, you know, it, the, the idea for these publications is to use their cash flow from, from subscriptions and put it into digital. And eventually when, you know. And someone in, in digital publishing would say that. Right? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I, I, I definitely also think it's true. OK, add creative, because I made a wee bit of a mistake there. Creative can be very emo emotive and uh, it can be very frustrating as well. I yeah. get a lot of frustration when people don't use frequency caps. It tends to be something that some people don't like to use. So what's the ad creative you never want to see again? Uh, so the ad format I never want to see again no, is, the, is, the is the banner ad, right? Banner ad. Yeah. And so I completely agree with your frequency point, and it's terrible, especially when it's retargeting. You like get the messaging <laughs> for the 30th time, and you bought the thing a month ago. Uh, but well, you, so and you know, you go to a conference like this. It's really interesting, I think, with banner ads, right? You go to a conference like this. Yeah. You listen to all of these examples, right? There are tons of great examples here yeah. of good ad creative. Yeah. None of them's ever a banner. Right? You've never gone to a conference. What about the expandable see, ones, the ones with video, and they got so much more advanced? They're now. still not good. I mean, so the, <laughs> the, the issue is like all good ad formats are kind of native to the experience, right? You have a print page or a TVC in the middle of a, I don't know, TV episode you love or something. And banners are just never native. They're just never there for the experience. So, so yes, you're anti-banner. I, I think they'll die. OK, next up, viral yeah. hits. Okay. So we've seen some huge viral hits. Gangnam, yep. you know, well documented. Yep. I think we had Like a Girl earlier on shown. Yeah. I personally hate, I want to hug all the cats. <laughs> um, so Peter, what is the most overrated viral hit ever? Uh, there, I, I don't think there is one. I mean, none. I think virality is a great signal of quality. I, I think it's actually like the best digital signal of quality we have. You know, uh, you like them all, even the cat one. I don't personally maybe love all of these, but I don't think you know that's a testament to the fact that they're overrated, right? Uh, yeah. They're by definition, if they're shared, they're not overrated. So it's a personal like, choice over overrating. Yeah. Okay, I get you. You're letting the public decide. So essentially, but I mean, I think that's, it's a it's a kind of a more powerful point than that. So we've been looking at all these different digital signals. In the last 10 years, we've looked at page views and video starts and like all of these things. And I think out of them all, sharing is actually like, well, one of the most powerful ones. To your point earlier about yeah. engagement as yeah. well. OK, celebrity impact. OK? OK. So celebrity endorsements have been around since day dot. You know, pretty much since advertising began. Yeah. Uh, the definition of a celebrity has changed a lot in the last couple of years with vloggers and uh, real, you know, all these kind of reality TV stars. So the use of celebrities in ads is what, Peter? I think it's increasingly complex. Okay. So I think, you know, we used to be able to tolerate that a film star was paid a lot of money to endorse a skincare brand on TV, right? I, I think people were generally fine with that. And it had lots of other effects. 
I think with these YouTube stars, to the authenticity point earlier, it's just we're just we're just much more sensitive to to endorsement in that environment because we almost consider them to be like a friend. You so know what I mean? They just have to be very good about it. Is Sorry? It? They just have to be very convinced. Yeah. About so it. if you're really good about it, and if it's really authentic, and it's if it's actually true, I think it can be immensely powerful. Maybe more so today than it used to be. I just think it's much more harder. So it's a, it's like it's a com more complex than it was 15 years ago, but it can still be very very powerful. Okay. Just in the nick of time. The next device. So GFK forecasts that 51 million wearable devices will be bought this year in 2015. So mobile, tablet, phablet, wearables, what's the next big it device? Well, if I only knew. I mean, um, I... Is it something in the pastry space? <laughs> yeah, maybe. No, but actually, I, I, so to your pastry point, I think, I mean, I, I, I don't think, I, I don't think we've, we're anywhere near the amount of mobile penetration and usage that we'll see going forward. I still think we're very, very much in the age of mobile. I think a lot of interesting innovation to me personally happens in like the home, the home space. I'd, I'd love my fridge to be much smarter than this. Okay. Um, and I think you know, what Google does with Nest and now, and, or what Nest has done historically is really interesting. So I think okay. the, home, the home space is really where Smart I'm, I'm personally interested. But. OK. So last one, disconnecting. So there's an emerging trend around disconnecting and digital detox. And would you believe in the States recently it came out that digital addiction, which is called internet use disorder, looks like it's actually going to be classified as an actual mental health disorder. So uh, Peter, yeah. the current digital detox trend is? Uh, ridiculous. <laughs> I, I think that's complete. Sorry, I mean, I, I think that whole, that whole like, the, 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 I think that's all completely ridiculous. I mean, it's like digitization is a huge thing, right? This, it's, a, it's the biggest kind of societal shift since the Industrial Revolution, right? But in which, in the Industrial Revolution, you still have this like romantic ideal of the countryside, right? We're yeah. just, it's the same thing happening now. You have parents in Silicon Valley spending 14 hours a day in front of their screen and then sending their kids to like, knitting school in the countryside. Uh, I just, yeah, I, I can understand that as a society we have a hard time sort of learning to live with this and adapting to this, but we will. Okay, last section, odds makers. So I'm gonna introduce the topic, I'm gonna make a statement about the future, and Peter has to tell me whether he thinks the probability of this statement be coming through or not. Okay, so the first one is online versus TV. So global video market, we all know, is exploding, okay? And eMarketer recently predicted that they reckon that online video spend will overtake TV spend in three years by 2018. So what's the probability that online global spend are, will take over TV spend in three years' time? Well, these prediction institutes are always right, so I... No. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I mean, I don't know, 50-50. Um, th it's certainly true that ratings are diminishing, like TV ra linear ratings are diminishing everywhere. And, uh, and, but the decline is not going to be linear, right? Because TV is still the place to buy huge GRPs in a very short amount of time. So there's a point in time where, where ratings will become sort of, it'll hit an inflection, there'll be a kink, yeah. and after which it'll go very quickly. Will that happen within the next 36 months? Um, maybe. Okay. Maybe. He's but, sitting on but, the fence. Yeah. Okay, next one. YouTube versus TV. Yeah. So YouTube just celebrated its 10th birthday. Uh, what is the probability that there will be another platform, bigger video platform in 10 years' time? Oh, 80 20. Like 80% probability that, I, well, I, I don't know that. I, I think the market's definitely fragmenting. So, you know, with Facebook video, Snapchat just announced they had 2 billion. Who? Years. <laughs> Two billion views a day. Um, you know, you have the whole SVOD uh, subscription video on demand sort of uh, sector exploding. So th it, there's definitely fragmentation going on. Will any one of these platforms be as dominant as YouTube has been? Uh, I don't think so. But it'll definitely like there's definitely competition for for YouTube in there. And then, but then, true to your point about uh, creative, like you're going to have to pick your platform then rather than multiple fragmented platforms. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay. execution keeps getting harder, definitely. While we're on the subject, our next topic is skip ads. Ah. Okay, so 
YouTube pioneered the TrueView ad, which is the skippable ad. And the whole idea was to give users choice and not have a negative brand experience by forcing people to watch stuff that they didn't want to watch. So what are the odds that you won't press skip next time you're on? He's smiling at me now, why? Like me you personally? Yeah. Oh, minimal. Minimum. I always skip the ads. Always. Yeah. And so I, David talked, uh, I listened to David before he talked about uh, TrueView as the uh, defining uh, ad product. I actually don't like it as an ad product. I, I think it's a, like, because it's never the creative's fault, right, that I skip the well, ad. Does it it's not the, force the creative to make better creative? No, no, no. Watch well, it might. I mean, that's the, inten that's the clear intention, right? Yeah. But, but the problem is, the problem for me is the intention, right? I come to YouTube to watch a singular clip most of the time, right? I want to watch that clip. It doesn't really matter how good the creative is before, right? I'll, I'll still skip it. So I actually am sort of a proponent of force feeding people ads in this way, right? I, 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 I'm much happier as a consumer when you force me to view the ad, because then I might actually like it and have an effect and sort of, I'd like it. I just don't like the option of being able to skip it. Well, just so the room knows, uh, not all uh, options and, and uh, ways of buying video on YouTube are skippable. You can do forced pre-rolls, so don't worry about it. If you if you have a mindset like Peter, you can still buy yeah, ads on YouTube. This became like a, a purchase recommendation now. Forced pre-rolls. Like <laughs> yeah. So there, there's something for everyone in the audience, irrespective of your taste. Oh, yeah, okay, good. Okay. Next topic: streaming yeah. versus TV. Okay. So really interesting online streaming app space. So take HBO, take BBC iPlayer, take Netflix, all well documented. BBC iPlayer, would you believe, had 234 million requests for program in February of this year alone. Yeah. Up 22% year on year, and half of them, 46%, came from mobile. So what is the probability or the odds that apps will replace TV channels completely? Oh, uh, very high, 80% plus. I'm glad you didn't ask, t uh, t Time. like, put a timing on this question. This, um, I don't, kind of happening you know, now, isn't it? Sorry. It's starting to happen now, and I, I'm really interested in what's happening, like, vert, vert, verticalized subscription VOD. So okay. you'd ha you've ha we've seen the Netflix and kind of the, what it's called, love film here, or, like, yeah. there these like broad OTT players. I think what's happening now are that actors like Taste Made or Country Roll or Drama Fever, all of these guys are starting to offer very niche type subscription services, um, which, is, is, which are essentially replacing you know, a traditional cable offering. I think it's hugely interesting. Okay, our next one. Second last one, content creators. So content creators, uh, take the likes of Zuella in the UK. Is it Simon Deuce in Germany? And PewDiePie in Sweden. PewDiePie in yeah, Sweden, good. of course. You know, they're bigger than brands. Very often there's a bigger following than brands. Yeah. Uh, is it tricky in the new world for brands to control their communications message about their products and services? So what are the odds of content creators taking over brand equity? Oh, hi. I mean, as you said, it's in the two Makes large... Makes them very two, powerful. Yeah, to a large extent, it's already happened, right? I mean, out of the largest 20 YouTube channels, I think, I, I don't know how many are, are people, creators and how many are brands, but there's a significant creators. majority of creators there. Um, though, I mean, all the creators that I've worked with and know uh, like to create, right? They don't like to sell ads or build technology or do all of these other things. And yeah. thus, you know, we see... Right, so multi-channel networks and like all of these other things, right? So I think in the ad space, in the B2B sort of ad space, um, there's still a huge room for publishers, aggregators, platforms, MCNs, like all of these guys. Okay. Our last one before we take Q&A. So get ready with the questions. We'll get the Androids out. Okay. So. The Science of Time recently published a really interesting article that says we're moving to a healthcare system that's going to be a predictive healthcare system, not the current system that we have right now, which is that sick care system, which basically kicks in when you get sick. This one will be predictive and try and prevent it. And it's all going to be down to what they call incitables. So right now we're talking about wearables. So I wear a Fit Band or I wear something to monitor how many steps I take and all that there. We're going to talk about ingesting these things or putting them inside our bodies. So what are the odds that this time next year, everyone in this room will have an incitable? Oh, Hard this room say. of early adopters. Yeah. Um, Try this in the best in the brand world. No, I was surprised when I came, you asked me to, to use the, the, the QR code to get in and not my RFID chip in my ah, hand. Ah, so, okay. Yeah. So you're already no, there. No, I don't, I don't have an RFID chip yet. But um, 
No, so seriously, yes, I think healthcare is one of these industries that is going to see huge disruption. I think this is one of the things that is going to happen, but uh, there's still a lot of social stigma uh, around sort of implanting things in our bodies for fun. And so I realize this is not for fun, but, um, but yeah, it takes a lot of time to change that mindset and culture. Like societal cultural change takes a lot of time. And what's the Almost cost generation. benefit tipping point? So to me, people adopt when the, when the benefit outweighs the cost. Yeah. So for me, I'm seven and a half months pregnant. If yeah. I had something I could put inside myself right now, thank you, seven and a half months, it's not too many pastries. So, uh, seven and a half months pregnant. So it's, they would tell me about my baby, I, I would do it because the benefit is outweighing the cost or the risk. Yeah, would you would you surgically implant something or would you take a pill? I mean, like, yeah. like so. I, I I think I think I think there are, I think there are. I mean, yes, the, it depends on the amount of friction. I think yeah. the lenses will see earlier, like the yeah. uh, the band aids, like all of that stuff. The things we put in actually inside. I, yeah, the I don't know. Okay. Okay, so we're out of time, but we've time for questions. We've nine minutes. So I think there was a question up here on content. We're going to get the Android out. As Anita said, if you can hug the Android and then talk into its ear. If you could please just tell us who you are and where you're from. And Julian's going to man the questions as well in terms of timing and answers. Okay, I think we'd want up the back yeah, there on content. Any more, just raise your hand and we'll get an Android in your direction. Do I need to talk in here or? Yeah. Great. Hi, Bastau from now on. Uh, you were talking about content marketing. Uh, we obviously read about it, but we feel the stress that I need to hire like at least 10 people to, to create content on all those platforms, keep it up and running, which is simply uh, too expensive for us. So we're within catch 22. If you do it with two people, it won't work. And for 10 people, we don't have the money. So how about that? Yeah, well, I think that's, <laughs> I think that's completely true. I think the way that publishers are trying to solve that is by essentially bundling distribution and content production. So you have kind of all these online publishing studios coming up where sort of they are trying to, in, to their best effort, use their own data, uh, the data they get from the sort of editorial messaging. And using that data and the knowledge they get from that con continuous content production and applying it to your brand problem, I think the what, what, what tends to happen there um, and what's problematic about that, that is that these guys are experts on their platform and their audience and not really on your brand. And so there's still a lot of friction I, when I see this around sort of that issue. But I, I think that's the way that, that the publishers are trying to tackle it. And I think if you have limited resources, it's also a good place to start to sort of go with one of them and use their data. I think it, you know, it's one of the core propositions that we have as publishers is that we, we publish so much content, so that sort of generates enough data to, to help our advertisers do the same thing. Thanks. Okay, do we have another question? Raise your hand. Any more questions? Yes, one in the middle, if we can get under it. Oh, it's on its way. Wow. You don't get to keep this one because it has a microphone in it. Where? where? Okay, my name is Viktor, I'm from Latvia, and I wanted to ask a question. Uh, uh, have people become more stupid in like, 10, 20 years because all they do on the internet is just scroll through Facebook timeline, read short messages, only titles of articles, watch short videos, watch only pictures, what else, where we are heading? No, so I think the exact opposite is happening. I, I think this is a usual like uh, argument that people are now ma making is that people are like, we glance more content today than we did 20 years ago. So that's one of the arguments that is made. And the other ones is we're in a filter bubble, right? Because we spend all these times in the social platforms and we only sort of reaffirm the views we already have. I mean, none of those are essentially true. So if you look at your ordinary Facebook feed or Twitter feed or Google Plus feed, if that product still exists. Uh, uh, well, you haven't been paid yet. So, uh, <laughs> uh, exactly. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> no, you get, you know, most people get a broader, broader set of information and the potential for a deeper sort of dive than you did in an ordinary um, sort of morning paper 10 years ago. And so I don't sort of buy into that myth at all, right? 
all the indicators we see of <coughs> you know, young people are that they are more informed, they make better political decisions, we have more. Okay. Any more questions? Raise your hand. One down here, if we can get the Android over. Well done. Hi, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Philip from Germany. So I have a question. You mentioned that uh, you have to create the content specifically per platform. So yep. if you have a limited budget, you would focus on one platform. Yeah. So I think in general, most of the brands are just creating TVCs and running them on all the platforms. So could you specify what you meant with that? Yeah, I, I, I think there were a few examples earlier here today with good YouTube campaigns um, that were none of them were like generic TVCs, right? No, none of them were 30 second spots. Uh, and I think that's symptomatic for all of these platforms. But wouldn't have this, these videos worked on Facebook as, as well? No, so the, my experience from video is that Facebook and, and YouTube works very differently. So Facebook w works mostly without sound and autoplay. So those that that so both and plus you know generally shorter material. So there are lots of things specific to Facebook video that doesn't translate at all to YouTube and vice versa. And so I think the difference between those two platforms is essentially as large as the difference between YouTube and like a 30 second TVC. Thanks. Any more questions? We're, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Daniel. I have a question about uh, that, uh, data ownership. Basically, uh, we are uh, all uh, uh, sort of uh, planning our campaigns based on data, and uh, people are getting more and more educated, and as they try to stay incognito and keep the data that they own. Do you think that uh, once the time will pass that uh, we won't have the data to make the segmented campaigns and so on? You mean that consumers themselves are getting better at like yeah. being incognito online? Yeah. Um, I think th that might be a market-specific question. I, we are not seeing that behavior. So generally in the Nordics, we, we don't see that we're getting less data out of our readers and consumers today than we did years ago. But certainly the, the, a lot of the platforms and a lot of the media publishers, the way they, they, they they have started to approach this issue is making people log in and really trying to um, move past sort of browsing or cookie data and into like, you know, logged in data, so to speak. Um, now I talked so much, I forgot the actual question. Well, uh, the basic question is, uh, should we go with opt-in option or still collect all the data that we, that we can? Well, that depends on your potential, your opportunity to make people opt in. Like if you're an e-commerce story, yeah, that makes sense to make people opt in. If you're sort of a brand with no reasonable sort of login opportunity, you should still go with cookie data. And I think, you know, there's still, in most markets, well, I, I shouldn't say most, because I might not know the specific markets, but in a lot of markets, there's still plenty of data to be used. Okay, Thank you. we're just out of time. So with that, oh, do we have one more question here? Okay, we've got uh, one minute. Yeah. Hi, Peter, I'm a fellow from Netherlands. Um, you just talk about uh, Facebook, that's a different platform from YouTube. Yeah. And uh, you also talk about uh, defining clear success metrics, uh, Mr. About to Success, at the yeah. start of the session. So can you just elaborate a bit more on the specific, uh, let's say, KPIs you look at in Facebook and YouTube? Yeah, so I, I think it's much more interesting, for example, so if you look at video specifically, it's much more interesting to look at completes than starts. So that's like a first, I think, hygiene metric that I would switch to, right? So a Facebook view is defined after three seconds. Uh, YouTube is, I don't know when the actual count, view it count starts. The, it depends on the, the length, length of on the, the video. Thing. Yeah, it's normally but, about a third. But in. so I, most of the time, I'm, I'm much more interested in someone seeing you know, 75% of my messaging or whatever your metric on that particular spot is. But I'd, lo I'd look at completes much more than I look at starts. But there are many like, more engagement metrics that you could go into. I just think that now I have, like, yeah. we're done. I'd be happy time. to take that more offline. Thank you. So look, thank you very much. Thanks for your audience participation. All that's left to say is thank you to Peter thank for his you. time. Thank, thank you. you to Julian for the time.